Many of you may not recognize this person on the screen. He lives here in Portland, Oregon. He was named the 17th most influential person of the century by Time magazine. This is Linus Torvalds. And if you've never heard of him, you've probably heard of the software he created. Linus Torvalds created Linux, the world's most successful software. It runs everything. I'm not kidding. It's in your phone. It's in a car. It's in your television. It runs your bank. It runs most of the global economy. It runs air traffic control systems, nuclear submarines. It runs most of the internet. You use Linux every single day, multiple times a day, and you don't even know it. So if you're in the tech industry, you for sure have heard of Linus Torvalds. And almost none of you have ever heard of me. <laughs> I'm Linus Torvalds' boss. Now I know what you're thinking, wow, this guy is the boss of one of the 17th most influential guys of the century, wrote the world's most prolific software, what else, who else works for this guy? The person who created the internet? Well, so first of all, no, Al Gore does not work for me. <laughs> but let me show you a couple of others who do, these two, especially that little girl there, that's my daughter. My four-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Nisha. And what's funny is, Nisha actually shares a lot in common with Linus Torvalds. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. First of all, they're both adorable. <laughs> Second, they're both geniuses. And finally, Neither of them listen to anything that I say. In other words, I'm nobody's boss. <laughs> but fortunately, Linus Torvalds doesn't really need a boss. He's got this great mascot, this penguin. And Linux really has done very successfully despite me. And let me show you a few numbers just to give you an idea of what this looks like. 1.3 million. 1.3 million smartphones running Linux are activated every single day. 700,000 televisions are sold every single day running Linux. 92% of the world's high performance computing systems that predict climate change, forecast the weather, run the CERN super collider are all running Linux. 85% of the world's global equity trading platforms run Linux. The New York Stock Exchange, the Tokyo Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, most of our economy runs on Linux. A thousand trillion dollars is the amount of transactions that happen on just one Linux system, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. It runs Google, Facebook, Amazon, most of the internet. It is by far the world's most widely deployed software. So, how does Linus do it? And why should you care for that matter? Well, he does it collaboratively by working with thousands of developers all across the world in different countries performing a grand act of creation. And I'm just a bit player in this grand play that's been unfolding over the last 20 years. But as a witness to all of this, and technically as Linus's boss, I've learned some lessons that I'd like to share with you today so that you might become better collaborators and so that you might achieve the same success as someone like Linus and something like Linux. 
And some of these lessons may surprise you. The first lesson I learned, don't dream big. Don't dream big. This is an email from Linus Torvalds over 20 years ago announcing the creation of Linux. I'm not doing anything big, just something for fun. <laughs> and what's interesting here, whether it was intentional or not, Linus was paraphrasing a poet, Robert Frost, who said, don't aim for success if that's what you want. Do what you love and believe in, and it will follow. And I think it's appropriate that Linus was paraphrasing a poem, because what's happening behind thousands of computer screens all over the world is a renaissance. The Michelangelos and the Da Vinci's and the Raphael's of their day are creating great poetry. And they're doing it because they love it. Linus felt so strongly about this that he wrote an entire book on it. And he named it, titled it, Just for Fun. Because when you're doing this kind of grand creation and collaboration, when you're doing it because you love it and you believe in it, you can create great things. And let me tell you, there is a difference between a house painter and da Vinci. And the grand code poets who are writing this truly believe in what they're doing, and it is making a huge difference throughout the world. And because they believe in it so much, they don't care about lesson two, which is give it all away. Give it away. You see, Linux is open source. Anybody can take it and use it completely for free. You don't have to ask permission. You can just take Linux, grab it, build anything you want. In fact, the only thing you have to do is if you make changes to Linux and improve it, you have to share those changes with everybody else. And when I tell people this, they think, you guys are idiots. You should have seen the crestfallen look on my wife's face on our first date when I told her I worked at a nonprofit. <laughs> Nobody can make any money, you know, giving things away, right? Well, that's not true, and I'm going to prove it to you. What if I showed you three companies, one based entirely on free and open source software, one based partially on free and open source software, and one that's completely based on closed software, they don't give anything away, they sell it. What do you think the results from those companies would look like? Well, here's what it would look like. This is a chart showing Red Hat, IBM, and Microsoft's results for the last five years. And at the top, Red Hat, a software company that gives away free software, that bases their entire company on free software, sells service and support, has gone up almost 200% in the last five years. IBM, which all of you have heard of, it might surprise you to know they sell billions of dollars of hardware, selling all, which contain almost entirely free software. And Microsoft at the bottom sells closed software that they create by themselves and sell for a price. In the last half decade, they have returned almost no shareholder value. So when I tell people this, they say, OK, Jim, that makes sense. We get it. But there's just one hole we can put into your argument, right? I mean, it makes sense. You know, Red Hat's doing well. This is a movement that we think is the future. But what about Apple, right? <laughs> you think you all got me, right? <laughs> How many people here have an iPhone? All right. I want you to do something with me. Take it out, go into the settings, go into general, about, and legal notices, right? And you're going to see something interesting in there. Inside of every iPhone, every iPad, there is free software. You'll see the GNU public license from the Free Software Foundation. You will see the names of prominent open source developers. You will see oodles and oodles of free software. Because Apple knows something that many people don't, but that I'm showing you today. 
which is when you stand on the shoulders of giants, when you use free software and take part in this grand collaboration, you can innovate at ever higher levels. And that's what Apple does, and it's pretty smart. So if anybody tells you you can't make money by giving things away, you tell them they are wrong. And then tell them about my next lesson. The best way to get something done is not to have a plan. <laughs> Don't have a plan. The plan for Linux is there is no plan, right? Well, what, this seems counterintuitive, but you're, you're not seeing the power of self-forming communities. When you collaborate, you want people to create things organically. And that's what happens within Linux. Organically, communities come together to solve their problems that if Linus Torvalds or me or anybody had tried to plan out, they would have never thought of. That's why Linux runs on a small handheld phone and also powers the world's largest supercomputers at the same time. And what happens here is an incredible cross-pollination of ideas where the person trying to save on battery life in a phone by controlling the amount of power Linux use helps the guy running the world's biggest computer because the cost of the world's biggest computer, the number one cost, it's not the, the hardware, it's not the software, it's the power and cooling. And so by creating these self-forming communities, they're exchanging these ideas and incredibly, adding all this incredible value and producing at a pace that's unprecedented. And let me just show you how unprecedented that pace is. 10,519, 6,782. That's the number of lines of code added to and subtracted from Linux every single day. A million lines of code were added to Linux just in the last year. Homer's Epic Iliad, 15,000 lines. War and Peace, about 450,000 words. Every single hour of every single day, seven changes happen in Linux. It is unprecedented. It has resulted in over $10 billion of value creation over the last 20 years. The most successful collaborative development project in the history of computing. 407 companies, thousands of individuals coming together in harmony. And speaking of harmony, that leads me to the next lesson, which is, if you're working that fast and you're working with that many people across this many cultures, you'd think you'd have to be good at collaborating, right? And you'd think you'd have to be a pretty nice person to get along with all of these people from different backgrounds. Well, you would be wrong. You don't always have to be nice. In fact, Linus Torvalds, sometimes he's not so nice. <laughs> Did I mention he doesn't listen to anything I have to say? <laughs> but what Linus is doing here is he's engaging in a flame war. Flame wars are how coders often communicate. They criticize each other. They defend their ideas. They ridicule code. In this world, code talks and BS walks, right? And you'd think this would be a bad way to create software, right? Yelling at each other all the time, these guys are pretty mean. Well, it's interesting, in 2003, University of California, Berkeley did a study about how ideas are created, how you can create the best ideas. And they took a bunch of people and they put them into groups. One group was given traditional brainstorming instructions, right? No idea is a bad idea, don't criticize, all of that. How many people here have brainstormed? Right, of course. Another group was given the instructions, debate, rigorously defend your ideas. And guess what? The debate group didn't just do better, they crushed it. They came up with an order of magnitude better ideas. And so what does all of this mean? How can you not dream big, give it away, not have a plan, and be a jerk <laughs> and get anything done collaboratively? Who, yeah, maybe Linus Torvalds can get away with it, right? But other people are catching on to this too. And this is really the future of collaboration. And I'm gonna show you that by asking you a quick question. Who do you think said the following statements? Code wins arguments. The best idea and implementation should always win. 
The hacker way is an approach to building that involves continuous improvement and iteration. Hackers believe that something can always be better and that nothing is ever complete. <laughs> Sounds like something Linus Torvalds would say, right? In fact, he's said things like this over and over again over the last 20 years. But he didn't say it. Mark Zuckerberg said this. And what's more important than the fact that Mark Zuckerberg said it is when he said it. Mark Zuckerberg said this on the eve of Facebook's IPO. This guy was about to become a multi-billionaire. And on the eve of the most anticipated financial event of the last decade in tech, he didn't talk about price earnings ratio or profitability. Instead, he wrote a letter titled The Hacker Way. Code wins arguments. May the best idea and implementation win. Because Mark Zuckerberg didn't have to be taught these lessons. They were instinct. When he created Facebook, he grabbed Linux, he grabbed free software, and he created the world's largest social network. And he was following a form of collaboration that has introduced an entirely new genre of the way that people can get things done. And this new genre of collaboration can be summed up in a simple idea. All of us are smarter than any one of us. Because you see, there's a whole generation of code poets out there working furiously. Poets who love what they do, who may not always get along, but are creating the next Google and the next Facebook. These individuals have created the coal and steel of the information age. And instead of that coal and steel being owned by the Carnegies, it's owned by everyone. That is the future. The future is a world in which you can enrich yourself while at the same time enriching others. It's going to be a pretty good place. And in that world, and I have to admit, I may be talking myself out of a job here, you don't need a boss. Thank you very much.